Good morning and welcome to all of you that are here with us today in the chapel and to those of you who are watching at the Richard B. Russell Special Collections Library or joining us online. I am delighted to have the opportunity to open the inaugural Johnny Isaacson Symposium on Political Civility. The late United States Senator Johnny Isaacson was a distinguished alumnus of the University of Georgia, and he left a legacy of statesmanship and public service that will continue to serve as an outstanding example for generations to come. He embodied respect and goodwill in the arena that often elevated extreme partisanship of the reasoned problem solving. And he did so every time without compromising his core beliefs and his values. Senator Isaacson's personal motto known to so many in this room was simply this, there are only two kinds of people in the world, friends, and future friends. It's reminiscent of President Abraham Lincoln's fa uh, famous words when he faced a divided nation in his inaugural address in 1861, and he said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. The Johnny Isaacson Symposium on Political Civility is now an annual event that will celebrate Senator Isaacson's legacy by focusing on the ways in which civil debate, mutual respect, and common interest in solving problems can advance the public good. The symposium features a moderated discussion between special guests who have a deep understanding and significant experience in overcoming differences so that they can serve the public interest and who have always practiced political civility. As a public institution that promotes the exploration of ideas and develops leaders for all areas of our society, the University of Georgia is the ideal location for this type of event. We are honored to have as our first Isaacson Symposium guest, U.S. Senator Joe Manchin from the state of West Virginia and former U.S. Senator Roy Blunt from the state of Missouri. Please join me in welcoming these distinguished guests. We are also grateful to have many members of the Isaacson family with us today, particularly the late Senator's wife, Diane. And we also welcome Attorney General Chris Carr and many members of the Georgia General Assembly. Please join me in welcoming these distinguished guests. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Heath Garrett, who I have known since he was a student at the University of Georgia, former Chief of Staff and political strategist for Senator Isaacson. Heath? President Moorhead, thank you very much. And thank you all for being here this morning. What, what a great occasion. It is right that we are here today to honor the legacy of Johnny Isaacson. But I must say thank you to Jerry Moorhead at first because we sit here at a moment that I think we can describe as nothing but the golden era from the University of Georgia. And it's because of great leaders like Johnny Isaacson and Jerry Moorhead and professors that are here today who helped build this fine institution. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here because it was 34 years ago last month that then President Dr. Knapp 
And Jerry Moorhead said, he, you need to go meet this young, up-and-coming Republican. We know you're interested in politics. I met Johnny Isaacson here at an alumni event, and within a few months, I was working with students for Isaacson. Here we are, 34 years later. I feel like I'm a part of a family who sacrificed as he sacrificed. And a little note, there are a number of people, some of them may have in this room, said he, I think an aspiring, ambitious young man probably shouldn't go to work for a Republican at this time. But I was just crazy enough to do it. And Johnny Isaacson, being the public servant that he was, he lost that race to Zell Miller. I tell you that story because as we talk about political civility, when we lose, people like me who work on the campaigns all the time become bitter. And we don't like the people that we, were, that we ran against. But I noticed that Johnny Isaacson did something really interesting, both in 1991 and again in 1996. He picked up the phone and he called the man who defeated him and said, Governor Miller, if there's any opportunity for me to continue to serve the state of Georgia, I want to join with you, my former opponent, in doing so. And I learned the most valuable lesson that I ever learned in politics. It's the stuck phrase that we say from Johnny all the time. It's the one that you just heard from Jerry Moorhead. He said, Heath, there are only two types of people in this world, friends and future friends. He said, people can say that, Heath, but more importantly, the difficulty is that can you live it? And for 34 years, with a staff of hundreds of interns, staffers, chiefs of staff who are here today, we all got to live 24-7 with a man who recognized the simplicity of the concept of respect and civility, but more importantly, he had the courage, he had the strength, he had the fortitude, and he had the faith to live it every day of his life. And so it is right that we honor him today with this. I also want to take a moment to share with you that in his last couple of years, he shared with the family and with us, the staff. He said, I know that they oftentimes honor senators with naming of buildings. He said, Heath, but in a hundred years, nobody's going to know who I am. What I care most about is that when students walk by some building on the campus of the University of Georgia, that what they're doing in that building is something that the students recognize and respect. And so to, to that point, we worked with Jerry Moorhead and Dr. Hoove in his first couple of months on campus. We started in 2019 with the idea that we could have the Isaacson Center for Neurological Disease Research. And I'm pleased to report that with the efforts of U.S. Senators, Jerry Moorhead, the Isaacson family, and corporate donors and individual donors from all over the state, over the last four years, we have raised over $57.5 million dollars to make the university the first to make the University of Georgia the leading neurological disease research center in the world. And I think the sky is the limit, all in honor of your father and your husband, Johnny Isaacson. Thank you all for what you're doing, and, and I'll leave you with what Johnny Isaacson left me with in the latter part of 2021. A lot of people say to us as chiefs of staff, we miss Johnny Isaacson. We wish he were still a U.S. Senator. And what Johnny Isaacson would always say to me after that is, he, you need to go help people understand that they too can do what I did. It just takes a little courage. Thank you all very much. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Matt Auer. I'm the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs here at UGA. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, for the first ever Isaacson Symposium on Political Civility. So at the School of Public and International Affairs, we have deep expertise in the study of extreme partisanship and political polarization. We've literally written the book on those topics. But that doesn't mean that we're fond of these phenomena in political life in the United States, and we really feel an obligation to train our students to do basically just the opposite. Uh, and hence, the focus on political civility, uh, meeting in the middle, uh, crossing the aisle, building bridges, that's what we train our students to do. We're extremely lucky because we have a homegrown exemplar in the form of Johnny Isaacson. You've heard a little bit about him. I hope many of you got to know him. I did uh, towards the end of his life. He's been so generous 
to the University of Georgia to our students. Always the best internships on the Hill for our students were in Senator Isaacson's office, regardless if you were uh, a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, he was an incredible mentor, statesman. And today I'm thrilled to introduce you to two additional exemplars of what I would call the Isaacson way. Senators Manchin and Blunt, I have some brief introductions. U.S. Senator Joe Manchin was sworn into the United States Senate on November 15, 2010, to fill the seat left vacant by the late Senator Robert C. Byrd. Born and raised in the small coal mining town of Farmington, West Virginia, Senator Manchin grew up learning the values that all West Virginians share, family, common sense, fairness, and hard work. From his days as a state legislator to his six years as governor to his current role, Senator Manchin has always been committed to his philosophy of, quote, retail government. In other words, connecting with all of his constituents and making service to them his top priority. As he has done throughout his entire life, he remains committed to working with Republicans and Democrats to find common sense solutions to the problems our country faces and is working hard to usher in a new bipartisan spirit in the Senate and in the House. Senator Manchin currently serves as the chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and also serves on the Senate Committee on Appropriations, the Senate Committee on Armed Services, and the Senate Committee on Veteran Affairs, four critical committees that tackle the important work of addressing our nation's energy needs, overseeing discretionary spending, defending our nation, and standing up for our veterans. And remember, folks, tomorrow is Veterans Day. Senator Manchin is an avid pilot, outdoorsman, hunter, angler, and motorcyclist. He's been married for more than five decades to the former Dale Connolly of Beckley. They have three children and 10 grandchildren. Now, Senator Roy Blunt. Following a distinguished career in public service, Senator Blunt, Blunt left the U.S. Congress in January 2023 after representing Missouri for 12 years in the United States Senate and 14 years in the United States House of Representatives. Among his many achievements in Congress, Senator Blunt is one of only two Americans in congressional history to be elected to a leadership position by his colleagues in both the House and the Senate. During his 12 years in the Senate, Senator Blunt served as chairman of the Senate Republican <coughs> Policy Committee, the Rules Committee, and led the presidential inaugural committees for the 45th and 46th presidents of the United States. By the way, the 45th president was a Republican, the 46th is a Dennis Bed. In addition, Senator Blunt was a key member of the Appropriations and Commerce Committees and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence as chair of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education, Senator Blunt's efforts were crucial in increasing funding for medical research. Blunt has, Blunt has been recognized by many health research advocates for his leadership during the COVID crisis and in the areas of Alzheimer's disease research and mental health. The National Institutes of Health, health recently named their Center for Alzheimer's Disease and related dementia in his honor. Prior to his tenure in Congress, Senator Blunt was a history teacher, a university president, a county official, and Missouri Secretary of State. He's actively involved in promoting and preserving the arts and history. He has served as a member of the Smithsonian Museum's Council of America Art, a member of the Kennedy Center Board of Trustees, and is president of the State Historical Society of Missouri. Currently, Senator Blunt serves as, as an executive fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C., chair of the advisory board of the National Geospatial Agency of the U.S. Government, and he serves on Southwest Airlines and Tenet's health care for boards of Jurassic. We are thrilled to have our senators with us. Please welcome them to the stage. I can prove the opposite.
welcome, Senators, for thrilled to have me. I have an open question for you. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what it was like to work with Senator Isaacson. Maybe you could speak to some specific experiences and tell us about his political style. Well, when uh, Johnny got to the Congress, I had been in the Congress for one term. So I started my second year. I had just become the Chief Deputy Whip, and the Chief Deputy Whip had just become the Speaker. Uh, and I immediately got Johnny to be part of our effort to move members in the right direction and toward a conclusion. What I like most, there are a lot of things I liked about Johnny, but as a legislator, what I like most is he liked to get things done. And they didn't have to be perfect. It was, he was more focused on the best solution possible rather than the best possible solution. And that's, that's he, he understood the art of politics as well as the science of politics. And uh, this was a, a great trend. We traveled together. He was in my group of people that helped us plan and organize getting things done. And nobody was better at calming down members who couldn't see the full picture uh, than Johnny Isaacson was. Well, I, uh, I was the governor of West Virginia and Bob Bird died. I had to make a decision. And uh, I thought, well, state was in pretty good shape, so maybe I could come and impart or something and, and help, uh, help our country. Well, when I got there, I found out that there were more people working against each other than there were working with each other. So I was looking for a respite, and I found Johnny Isaacson. And it was just, uh, it was, uh, I was on it. Uh, he was chairman of the VA committee, and I was on VA, uh, that was his uh, administration. And, uh, and I just never met anybody like John. I knew Johnny coming from the South would have that Southern charm. I knew he would have that Southern hospitality. But to be so genuine, and Johnny, and, and I don't need to tell, he don't need to tell Chris, I don't need to tell anybody what you all had in John, but to share him with us, and I, what I admired about Johnny Isaacson, whenever he spoke on the floor of the Senate, and things were getting pretty toxic to him back then. This is in 2010, 2011. And Johnny would start out by saying, my friend. Now my friend here, my friend there. Now I don't know if that person knew they were Johnny's friend, but Johnny knew that they were his friend. <laughs> he made sure of that. But he's just put everybody at ease. You knew right then, a calmness came over you. It was going to be very, very civil, and, and, uh, and there are chances of good things happening. And I want to say to everybody here, Johnny Isaacson, what he did for the veterans, what I saw first of all, what he did for every veteran, he had such a respect for anyone who put a uniform on, man or woman, to put themselves in harm's way for our country and basically take a bullet for you and me. And he never let anybody in that committee ever forget the purpose of what we're there. He gave them the, the best service we can when they return home. And we did everything that we can. It made some historical moves and some legislation to change health care and benefits for, for veterans more so than any time in history. We read a lot about uh, political incivility, and uh, it, it seems to be uh, basically every day when we turn on our, our favorite websites and news sources. I'm wondering if you could tell us in your own experience about um, some significant examples of problem solving and bridge building that the media either uh, misses or just doesn't want to report on for whatever reason. Well, it, it takes a bipartisan approach to get most things done. In fact, if you miss that opportunity, you really create a great target for one side if, if you can't get anybody else on the other side to work with you. And the more people you can get to work with you, the more you come up with a product that the next Congress is not going to look at and think, well, we ought to change that bill, or well, I wonder why they did that. Um, I, one year on my staff, there were 52 on our side, the Republican side, and 48 Democrats. My staff came to me, they said, we thought we'd just check and see how many of the Democrats you had sponsored a bill with? You were the principals, not just a co-sponsor, but the two principal sponsors of the bill. And the answer was 44. And I, I, I was really pleased to hear that. And I, on my last comments I made on the Senate floor, when I was talking about the importance of working together and getting things done, 
I said, you know, get something done with one of our friends on the other side. You don't have to agree with them on everything. You just have to agree with them on one thing. And when, when you do that, the hour, both of you and your staff begin to look for, well, surely there's one other thing we agree on when you successfully get one thing done. And it, it changes the whole uh, atmosphere between you and that person, you and that staff, looking for something else you can do together. Let me tell one quick story. So about 12 years ago, 10 years ago, it was uh, 2013, Senator uh, Stabno, a Democrat from Michigan, we'd done a lot of work together, particularly on federally qualified health centers. And she came saying to me, said, well, why don't we try to do this? We just completed getting the health centers funded. Why don't we try to do this for community mental health centers? And I said, that's a great idea. Let's do that. We came up with a bill. We really didn't know that we had come up with a bill that 50 years ago that Congress had committed to do this. And so the last day of October, of October, the last week of October 2013, we went to the Senate floor, both of us at the same time, to talk about the last bill President Kennedy signed 50 years earlier to that, that week, which was the Community and Mental Health Act, which had been designed to do two things. One was to close most of the asylum-like institutions in the country that weren't serving people very well, and two was to replace them with high quality, 24-7, 365 days a year certified community health centers. And the country did an unbelievable job on closing those facilities. The, set, the, the 70s, if you're old enough to remember the 70s, you remember the hospital in your state that there was a debate about whether to close it or not, Joe, and then they did. Maybe. But almost no, almost no community and almost no state did the other thing. And so we were able to get we wanted to, everybody can qualify. We want every state to start doing this. We got a 10 state pilot. 10 years later, we're back on the Senate floor in 2023 with the Public Safety Act after Uvalde, Texas. Uh, and we, get, we got a pathway for the 40 other states to treat mental health like all other health. It was the biggest spending thing in that bill. The press didn't cover it and still hasn't covered it very well, but it's making a big difference, totally bipartisan, uh, a commitment that we both made, and we worked together on that, and so many other things to find a solution that would last. And even though we're 60 years beyond the time that the government committed to do this, I think we have, we have a plan that finally achieves that goal <laughs> from 60 years ago. Bye bye. I don't know where to start. <laughs> the, the, I was so, uh, I, was, I was just mesmerized and, and so uh, taken by surprise at how uh, polarized the uh, Senate was. The Senate is such a special place. Our founding fathers designed it to be that special place. So if you want to know why we have a filibuster, why nothing in law, nothing in the Constitution that says that we have to have a filibuster. Um, but can you imagine Washington and, and Jefferson and Franklin and all of them, and someone had to act to 1789, the convention they started to reform the sub 1787, sub 1789, had to go out and tell Massachusetts and uh, New York, Pennsylvania and Virginia that we're gonna have a bicameral. We're gonna have a house in the Senate. The house will be the people's. Every two years we rotate and you're always out and getting, getting basically input from the people. The Senate's going to be kind of a, a little different. And guess what? Every senator is going to, every state's going to have two senators. Can you imagine at that time someone in Massachusetts says, you mean Rhode Island and Delaware is going to have the same representation that can stop my vote? Yeah. We're not the big guys beating up on the little guys. This is going to be called the United States, not the divided states. So, if you want to know where that came from, that perme it permeated from there. Always for us to make sure the one side didn't rule. How many times in history have we had 60 on one side? Mm -hmm. Oh man, in 234 years. So, when I got there and I saw how divided, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to sign on bills that aren't bipartisan. I'm not going to be part of a bill that's not bipartisan, because it goes nowhere. And if it would, it won't last. Because it'll be undone as quick as you do it. So once you figure out how the place works and how it's supposed to work, 
then you've got to make sure you do everything you can to fulfill that. So look at, look at 2017, I mean, uh, 2020, our 117th Congress, mm -hmm. right? The 117th Congress, Roy and I were there, and it's 50-50. And the hit, you all learned, all of us have lived through history. In 234 years, the Senate's never been equally divided for that long of a period, right. never. So what would happen is, oh my goodness, they'll never get anything done. We just had basically an election that's been contested to this day, it's still being invested. A lot of elections are saying whether or not, you know, you can't, you can't be in the political process and have a democracy and have an orderly transfer of power and the only good election and the only fair election is the one you win. It doesn't work that way. Okay, you have to accept her. I've lost an election. And most people in this system have gone through. John went through it, but never gave up because, as John would say, the bottom line is, my main job is to make sure that whoever my president is, whether I vote for him, whether I'm the same political party or not, or the same ideological beliefs, I want my president to succeed. If my president succeeds, my country will do great, and my state will do great. Once you take that approach, you're not looking at basically throwing darts at everybody. You're looking at how do you get the best out of it. So we got into the 2020, uh, Joe Biden comes in, gets inaugurated. January 6th comes, and we know what happened. And for all, any of you all might have thought that that was a visit to the Capitol. <laughs> I did too. Now, me, I'm always optimistic. I'm thinking that I've heard noises and rallies when I was in the state legislature. We used to have to close our big doors and have to rally outside and all the protests and all that, but nothing vibrant. So when I'm hearing all the doors rattle on January 6th, when we were locked into the Senate, remember it's Roy, and I'm thinking, why don't we just go out and talk to him? I don't want to do I'm sure we can all, all of us have skills of talking to people and personalizing things. And, and then uh, if you watch Christmas Vacation when the SWAT team comes through the way, <laughs> that's how they, we looked around and there were people with more ammunition on them and more guns than Carter had lived. I said, oh my, this is for real. Took us down there, downstairs and everything. So after that, we were able to pass the Electoral Count Act, so it'll never happen again, bipartisan. The chips asked because we want to make sure that we're not held, held captive by unreliable foreign supply chains such as China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, all the things that we did. It'll go down as the one of the most productive Congress, one of the most productive times of Congress in history. And so, so how could that happen when so evenly split? I, I use this analogy. There's no one to blame. You had a fisty, we had a fisty. <laughs> Whose fault is it? Both are faults. No one can be blamed. We had to work together. The bipartisan infrastructure bill came out with the BB bill. Is the BB bill back better? Joe Biden's big bill, which, which is far, far overreaching. But we, 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 we pulled that one out. And we said, we've got to have bipartisan infrastructure. It should be because we didn't do anything for 30 years. Bridges, roads, internet, and all the things we needed. But it's bipartisan. We start putting bipartisan committees together. And once we did that, we had Chuck Schumer said, Chuck, pull that bill out. I had to make a deal, and Roy, I think Roy knows about this. I had to make a bill, bill to let them to vote. They needed my vote to get on discussing and debating the Build Back Better, which I was against. But I had to make that bill let them get on it so we could debate it. But they had to give me a chance to work with my friends on the Republican side for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And then we had to get a privilege on the floor to get a vote on it to make sure that if we had an agreement bipartisan, we get a vote. Well, we got the vote and we passed it. And those are the things you got to do. And you can't do it if you don't have people on both sides that look for the good. You can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And right through base politics is, if you want to be against something, it's not good enough. You can be against it and go home and defend. Uh, it was okay, but it just wasn't good enough. Well, guess what? The system wasn't designed to be perfect. It was designed to make improvements. And it's still a work of problem. Thank you, Senator. Senator, uh, back in 2016, uh, you had um, an effort to uh, put a lot of funding towards Zika virus, over a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. And eventually you got that, that uh, funding in a, in a spending bill. Um, nevertheless, it was an incredibly arduous and long path. And I, I'm just curious, having followed that, were there moments where 
uh, that tested your patience and your political civility and uh, did you encounter political incivility in the process? I mean, based on what I was seeing in the Washington Post, it, it kind of looked like it behind the scenes, but can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, by, by 2017, I had a lot of, I had a lot of patience by 2016. I've been in the for <laughs> 20, almost 20 years, and my patience is one of my, actually one of the things that has helped me do what I do. I, the, the Zika virus was, I, nieces and, and people who were really concerned about this, all young women, families were. The Zika virus was a challenging thing. I, I think the amount of money we needed, whether we were really going to need it or not, those are the kinds of things that Congress always deals with. About a little before that, and it's a related thing, really I have more view of changing the trend of NIH funding generally for health care research than I really do Zinka. And uh, when I started chairing that subcommittee, the Labor Education uh, and uh, Health Subcommittee, which is the committee that has most of the money after you take the fence off the table, has about a third of all the money left in that one committee and about 100% of the problems in that one committee. Uh, and NIH uh, had not had an increase in funding, not one penny for 10 years. They thought they were about 22% uh, lower in spending dollars than they'd been a decade earlier. Young researchers were leaving research. And uh, Dick Durbin, who's the whip at the, the Democrat whip at the time, on the appropriations committee with me, said, you know what, I know one of your pro one of your what you want to do is is increase NIH funding again and get caught back up and, and get ahead. I do too. He said, just remember when you're doing this, he said, when you're chairing this committee, the Labor, Health, and Education Committee, he said, I remember the exact word he used, he says, you're in the Democrats' church. Uh, he said, every line of this budget is sacred to some, some of us, and most of it is sacred to all of us, but I'm going to help. Uh, and so that year, we eliminated or combined 36 programs, had the first billion dollars, to go into NIH, and then over the next, and, and frankly, others on the committee were not too thrilled about this, and the House was, Rosa DeLora, who's a good friend of mine on the House side, was not thrilled about this. Not that she didn't like this priority, but she had a lot of priorities. And I said, well, Rosa, if, every, if, one, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, this is my priority for the committee. I want to do what you want to do, too, but this is something that's always been the thing that we could, in a bipartisan way, rally around. And after we did that the first year, the response was so significant uh, that, that, that Rosa DeLora, Patty Murray, Tom Cole, the Republican chairman of this committee on the House side at the time, over the next eight years, we increased NIH funding by 57%. Uh, Alzheimer's funding by 500% from 600 million to 3.2 billion a year. Uh, and uh, each year, I think we all got better at knowing how people were reacting to that. And the moment we were in were personalized medicine, immunotherapy, things that were not options, previously were, but they weren't going to be taken advantage of like they should unless this was a place where the government could, through all the great institutions, including this one in the country, that get NIH grants lead the way. And, and to me, that was really a, a bigger challenge, because you had to break a pattern, you had to take money from somewhere else to do this, uh, and you had to do it in a bipartisan way, because the way the House and Senate works, uh, it just had to happen that way. I think you know, the Zinca funding was a, was, was a, a challenge, but the bigger challenge, I think, was reprioritizing. And it's easy in government for every single thing to be a priority. Uh, and then we figure out how to make one thing a real priority. And, and we did that, and it was bipartisan. And uh, at a couple of events, was I, I was retiring from the Senate. Uh, an equal number, or sometimes more Democrats, showed up for those events to talk about what we'd done together than Republicans, and you know, when, you, when you have accomplishments, you begin to both embrace each other and embrace each other's goals, and 
uh, it makes a difference. The, uh, the uh, electoral count, uh, I was one of the counters in the last two uh, presidential counts, and Senator Klobuchar and uh, Mike, the vice president and I left the building at 348 the next morning, but we'd gotten our work done, we got it done where we were supposed to get it done, uh, and Amy and I had the committee that dealt with these issues, but Joe really stepped up with Susan Collins and others and decided we're going to put a group together that we think is even more reflective of the whole Congress uh, than the committee might be, and we're going to work together to solve that problem, and we did. Speaking on that, just following up real quick, when we started sitting down, how do we prevent this from ever happening again in insurrection? How do we stop that? We're even given temptations to anybody. Uh, so we were looking at it and went back all oh, back in the 1800s and how this was a big piece of legislation that really had bad weather, weather BAs and all that, if you look back in those elections. So we were looking at everything in history we could. And so then at that time, at that time, if you'll recall, uh, voting rights, and hampering voting, encouraging people to vote, they want to change the whole voting system. So we started out talking in a room uh, and everyone was talking, we're going to do this, we got to do this, and we just can't leave this out. You got to look at how people basically have to stand in lines and, and, and early, early votes and all the different things through the voting process. Georgia was on our mind. <laughs> Chris knows exactly. Chris was on our mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, we looked at everything we could, and, and, and we start. We just couldn't come to any agreement to go any further on some of the more far-reaching things. It finally came down to where we had narrowed it down. How can we stop having a vice president, as strictly a ceremonial, but making uh, making sure that he never or she never is in a position to be held to where that could happen again, to where it could really disrupt the whole process. And Roy, when they when they rushed us out, of, when they were getting attacked by all, all of our visitors. <laughs> if you wanted to speak to... <laughs> I swear to God, I think I could have talked him down, Rock. <laughs> when, you, when you think about that, and then we were all, they just leave everything on the desk, just get out of here. Go now. And thank God, our, our, uh, our doorkeepers, they picked up the ballots that were laying on the floor that we walked out. Well, the box, the box, the ballot boxes, the boxes that we... If we'd have lost that, I mean, it, I didn't sum it up with that. Can you imagine the conspiracy discussion? Oh, my goodness. Even though the boss is just full of envelopes that, that everybody knows. Everybody knows, what, but still yet. Yeah, and uh, the staffers, as we were leaving, hadn't brought those wooden boxes with us because the people got into the Senate chamber, and if we'd have left them there, oh my. and they would have taken them or opened them or anything, it would have been not only, you, know, you can just imagine oh, right. in the moment we were So in. we stopped that. So we finally came, let's just stop that. And everyone agreed, we can do that. And it wasn't, we knew that we had the serious, most serious problem. We never wanted an insurrection in two weeks and, 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 a, uh, and a January 6th to ever happen again. So we prevented that from ever being, we have to do the, the ceremonial count again. No one will be in that position where they said, well, let's go rush the Capitol, we'll be able to change the vote outcome. So. But Joe's comment that he could talk them down, somebody asked me one time I was at an event, they said, What's, what do you think is the most common characteristic of people in the Senate? And I said, me included, almost totally unjustified self-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Manchin, um, did you have a reputation of being an independent and in the context of political civility or incivility, does that actually make you a, a bigger target for political incivility, even within your own party? Let, let me just say to all the young people, all of our students here and everything, uh, I didn't get involved in politics because of the party affiliation. I got involved in a political process because I wanted to change things and do things. In our system of, of government and democracy, we have a duopoly. So you only have two, two paths, really, a Democrat and Democrat Republican path. My family, as like most, probably most in this generation, if you go back one or two, was Southern Democrat. West Virginia is the northernmost Southern state in the nation. We're around the Mason-Dixon line. So that's just who we were. Our state was a Republican state probably until 1930. West Virginia was all Republican. FDR comes along. My grandparents are grateful they gave them a chance to survive and take care of their kids. 
and it's that loyalty factor, but you still never change who you are. If a D or a MR changes the person, then you've got the wrong person in the job for the wrong reason. If a D or an R is a vehicle you have to use to, to really truly get public service, that's the vehicle you should use, that's what you have. Right now, it's just not working that well, so it puts me in a predicament. I never did, look, if Roy comes to some, said something, and Roy knows how toxic the place can be. Let's say that my dear friend Roy is up and wait, he's, he's in cycle, he's up for election. The way both of the parties are thinking from the leadership, Joe, you can't sign on to a bill with Roy because it might make him look good and help him in his election. I said, it's a darn good bill. I like the bill Roy has, and I'm for it. I'm going to sign on to it. Oh, no, that's so then the Democrats get mad at me. Republicans will get mad over sure right. And, they, and then, then they expect now I'm supposed to write a check out of my pack that if Donnie Duck is running in Missouri against Roy Blunt on the Democratic ticket, we got to beef with Donald Duck when he's a Democrat. I says, I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry, I just didn't come for that reason and purpose. That's not why I got involved. I got involved because a guy told my father, he said, John, you should me a favor, because all the little favors I've been for your little town in Farmington. And I said this in, this in my, in my statement I made the other day, I said, hey, Dad, I'm gonna get out. That's awful. That person's, that's his job. It wasn't a favor. He, that's what he's supposed to do. So I said, I'm gonna get involved in politics. And my dad said, oh, Joe, please don't. It's a poor little thing. <laughs> now that I think about it, he's probably right. Uh, he said, please don't do it. He says, I'm telling you, this is horrible. It's just this thing went on. I said, Dad, yeah, I should. He always said, uh, public service is the noblest of all profession. Good people, you have to try and put people to get involved and want good things to happen. I said, I think you all did pretty good raising me. So give me a shot. And he says, on that one condition, one condition, he says, as long as you give me a vow that you will serve friend and foe, and not yourself. That was it. And the reason he did that, I, first time I got in politics, there was a guy who was supposed to be for me, and he said, oh, Joe, I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna help you. And I don't need to tell all my friends in the political arena, sometimes people change their mind, or they, they, or they play both sides of the fence, but they're not sure if you're gonna win or not. And I was so mad at this person, and this led me. And I'm thinking, oh boy, and I won, and I won it. And my dad, as soon as I won, dad says, I wanna talk to you. He said, you're, you're, you're mad at Charlie, aren't you? I said, Dad, Troy to double cross us. He liked him. He said, so what do you think you're going to do? You want to try to figure a way to get back in and make sure he knows you, you won and he lost? I said, I, he said, I know, what you, I, know, I know human nature. I know where you are right now. I want you to do one thing first. Go to the courthouse. Find out what Charlie's taxes are. You write a check and pay Charlie's taxes. Then tell him you're not going to support him. And boy, that's, he says, okay, now, son. Did you do that? No. <laughs> Maybe you ought to go around the country and talk to people about this. You talk about <laughs> so that my vow, my vow was, is that friend or foe, I could care less. The minute that election, whether I won or lost, it was over. Everybody, I go back to the Johnny Isaacson. That's my friend. You know, I think that another thing Johnny and I had in common on this topic is we were major minorities in our part of state when we started in politics. And I think it changed, that changes the way, to some extent, if you look at this. When I was elected Secretary of State almost 40 years ago, I was the first Republican, and Jack Joe was Secretary of State, I was the first Republican in 52 years to hold that job. And when I got to the House and quickly got at the leadership table, it occurred to me pretty soon after I was there, because I just looked at everything differently, that I was the only person at that table that winning the primary hadn't been the same as winning the election. You know, winning the primary, well, when you're the first person in your party to be elected to something in 52 years, when you're, uh, you, you don't present yourself first and foremost as, you've got to vote for me because you've never voted for a Republican in 52 years for this job. You've got to say, I'd like to work for you and I'm the right person to do this job. When you're Johnny Isaacson and there are a handful of people in the legislature when you get there, it's easy to become minority leader if you just happen to miss one meeting and they say, we'll make Johnny the leader. Uh, but you look, at, you look at politics from that point on differently. Uh, and you know, Joe's seen, and I, we've all seen our state of transition. You know, when I was elected secretary, the legislature in Missouri was, was two to one Democrat and has, had been for as long as anybody could remember. The whole eight years I was there doing that job, 
Uh, but now it's two to one the other side. You saw the, the change in, in your state the other way. It changed more rapidly than any state uh -huh. We have right. 134 people in the legislature, 100 House of Delegate members and 34 senators out of 134, 120 are Republican. No state like ours. And these are all good people. Most of them were Democrats when I was there. Now they're Democrats. And the number was about opposite. You it was opposite, exactly. You had all Democrats. We had one time, I had, I had 33 Democrats in the Senate, one Republican. Uh, Donna Bowley was able to be uh, the minority whip, the minority leader. <laughs> <laughs> and then another Republican won <laughs> the, the last, uh, another election. And we had a guy can Truman shape and fund as could be. And Truman says, and, and, and the guy that won, then he voted for himself and it was a tie. He took us and he beat her out. No, there was three people, three, three Republicans then. So the two voted against Don and threw her out. Truman Chafe was in majority leader at that time for the Democrats. He upset said, Don, I told you you couldn't trust the Republicans. <laughs> and it was, we just had so much fun with it. It was never so toxic. I, I just want all of you, don't get caught into this visceral, this hatred. You don't have to hate someone to be against them. You don't have to hate someone to disagree with them. You, you just have to basically figure out, maybe we just can't get together. Maybe we just have to find something we agree on. I always start every meeting saying, okay, what do we agree on? They said, we don't agree on anything. That's why we're here talking to you. And I said, oh, shame. And I said, well, football, baseball, basketball, soccer, what, what do you, once you get someone say, yeah, my kids are in this, they start talking, they have something in common. Once you find a commonality, you can usually move forward. If you can't find the commonality, you got a problem. And I have a problem, and, and uh, you know, we did Tosca, toxic, uh, you know, all the toxic chemicals that are being used that we weren't basically regulating. For 37 years, they've been trying to pass Tosca. And uh, Lottenberg, Frank Lottenberg, and Frank was dying. He was a senator, and he's from New Jersey, and Frank was just a great guy, but hard, hardcore. And Frank says, Joe, uh, I can't get this done. Well, then a Republican senator uh, from Louisiana came to me and said, Joe, would you take this Tosca bill and try to run with it? And I said, David, I said, who had this bill before? And I looked and I said, Frank Lautenberg. I said, Frank, that's his bill. I'm not going to jump in front of Frank. Someone, Frank, I said, Frank, they came to me and want me to take the bill because we have got to expand. We had 200, uh, at that time, 200 chemicals we were evaluating properly. We have thousands that we're using every day. So we wanted to make sure of that. And so I went to Frank and Frank said, Joe, listen, uh, I'm very sick. And he says, I, I, I've tried, I can't get it across the goal line. He says, go ahead and take it for me. So I said, Frank, I'll do it in your honor. So we started meeting. So I called the first meeting, Roy, you'll love it. And I knew that the staff, I knew staff were going like this at because it had been ingrained for so long. So I walked in the room and I could see the chief of staff of the one gentleman, they're all in the front, and I saw the former ch the chief of staff of Frank Ottenberg. Those two just absolutely were never going to agree on anything. Mm -hmm. So I said, this is our first meeting, and Frank asked me to set in for him, and I would like to ask you two to leave the room. They said, what? I said, trust me, if you two leave the room, you meet just an hour or two, and we'll call you back in. We were able to agree and move the ball forward, and they just <laughs> And we got a piece of legislation done now that Basically, this happened, but you want to be able to identify, you're just not going to get by some people. And you have to do it in the kindest way, and you can't hate a name, but you got to just say, let us move forward, that's all. But that's what Johnny had, and Johnny had a knack that if he would ask you, Joe, just give me a chance to see if I can work this out. Well, you know that Johnny would work it out. And he, Johnny could, Johnny could, he could sense the temper, the temperament, and he could also, the temperature, of each person, and if he knew that person was staying at that high temperature, Johnny couldn't get, even in the VA committee, we couldn't get certain things done. So Johnny would call timeout. He was famous for calling timeout. Well, we'll come back. And we'd go out and come back, and Johnny would talk to that person. It would change the whole demeanor of our meeting we'd come back. I think one of the problems now is, too, that people get their information in such diverse and, in many ways, shallow ways. You know, they get them Media is very broad and very shallow. There's not much depth that allows you to actually cover issues. But more importantly, maybe in the world we live in and the people we work with, that we work for, uh, we're at a moment now where we have a hard time to, to, to agreeing on the facts. 
You know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan became famous saying, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And now everybody wants to bring their own facts to the argument. And it's incredibly hard to reach a conclusion if you can't agree of the facts of what you're trying to deal with. And finding, and everybody comes with their facts. One of our colleagues who came the same time we did to the Senate told me a year or two ago, he said, you know, when I was, we were first here, people would often say in the East, but well, I don't agree with that vote, but you know a lot more about this than I do. He said, I can't remember the last time anybody I worked for said to me, you know more about this than I do, because everybody's found their own, and often very, very narrow view of what's going on. And in their mind, those are the facts. And if you try to persuade them differently, you're just somehow become part of the deep state or whatever. I think that's one of the huge societal problems. We're gonna to have to figure out how we once again take our different opinions find a better way to agree to the facts and then reach the, the successful and, and, and for public policy and the success, uh, you know, we've all known people that thought they were always right. You met someone thought they were always right. Mm -hmm. Okay, we said that's a person who just thinks they're always right. I came to the conclusion that if we're going to go forward, I got, I, I've, I've never met the first person who's always wrong. Now, I've walked away from them things are crazy in the bed bugs. <laughs> but that was because I walked away from the And I thought, I, everybody had something to offer to the system. Everybody, you know, when Benjamin Franklin said to me, but after the convention, they said, what, Mr. Franklin, what type of government do we have? He says, you have a republic, young man, if you can keep it. A republic means that you and I own it. So I go in the schools and I'll say, students, I say, what do you do for your country today? They look at me like I'm a foreign, foreign alien. And I, they said, why would you ask that question? I said, because you own it. How do you take care of things you own? What do you do for it? You have an obligation. You feel like you, know, you have a commitment to do something because you have an investment. And we're losing that. Most of the schools coming, there's so many schools don't touch civic session. I'm, I'm finding that out. And the most rewarding thing I've seen in education in the challenge program. You, you know, the, the National Guards have a challenge mm -hmm. with their students that basically have not much of a choice, but when they go oh, when they go wayward, they have a choice of either going to juvenile detention or going to a challenge academy. And these challenge academies are tough boot camps run by the National Guard. I have never seen a more transformation in young people who are dying to have some some guidance in their life, some structure in their life, some discipline in their life. We've got a child this year went through it. I thought the kid would definitely be before in school. And he's now going to go to a, one of our academies through this, through this promise. So I, I, how do we instill that? And, and I don't know, we're losing a grip on, on public education. We seem to be dumbing down. We're not asking and, and we're not challenging enough as we used to. And unless you have the wherewithal to have private schools or be able to choose neighborhoods you get a better education, there's going to be an awful lot of Americans left behind. Public education makes us different. Higher education takes us to the next level. And when you look at our standing in the world right now, that's a challenge I'm scared more than anything that we're not going to be able to meet the necessary uh, challenges that the world's going to throw at us. And now the big thing, Roy, since you've been gone, we've been having meeting after meeting after meeting on artificial intelligence. If you think the internet causes problems, and if we don't get our hands around this one, God help us all, but the greatest then about AI, it can solve and unlock so many of our medical challenges. It has the ability to find cures that we can never find as a human quick enough and more effective and efficient because of the super, I mean, the competing problem, I mean, the competing capacity yet. So we're anxious about that, but we're trying also to prevent the, 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 the harm that it can do. One quick harm, MIT students, uh, MIT, MIT students. One class assignment was given to them. They said, see if you can create a pandemic. We'll give you one after you know, one class. See if you can, these were not science, these were not biologist students, these were just regular MIT, an MIT student. Within one hour with GPT chat, they were able to not only identify, create it, and find out how to put in the pump. One hour. It was unbelievable, as scary as can be. So we're trying to make sure that we put these guardrails on, and if we can, then make sure the whole world 
is able to, to agree on the, the, uh, the dangers that AI has, but also the uh, absolutely unbelievable success it can be, especially in healthcare. That is certainly one issue that's going to require a lot of bipartisan cooperation. I'm, I'm glad you're having those meetings. I actually didn't think the Senate had gotten anything done since I left. <laughs> I say, we might not get a finish since you're not there, you might come back. So apart from that remark, uh, I, uh, I heard a great deal of uh, what I would call the channeling of the Isaacson way. And I think this has been really constructive for our students, so I want to thank you. Do we have just a couple minutes for closing remarks? Is that a possibility, Professor Hanks? Uh, Senator Bullen? I was going to ask you what kind of advice you were going to give to somebody in the future that was asked, asked to moderate a discussion between two senators. You know? <laughs> well, it, uh, a runaway I mean, team here. Yeah, the Isaacson way is coming through loud and clear, so. Well, it is. And, uh, you know, pleased to be here, pleased to be part of uh, the inaugural event for this. Um, I know it mentioned earlier that Johnny didn't want buildings named after him, but. Uh, um, we're naming a new building at CDC at Atlanta in, a, in something I was able to put in, in our bill in a bipartisan way, kept it in there the um, year before last. Uh, and then uh, Senator Ossoff and I uh, sponsored some legislation right before I left to name the VA Center at Decatur for Johnny. But uh, he's a he man of ideas, a man of action, uh, determined to get things done. I think having this focus on him and the kind of career that he led and the kind of success that that kind of career can produce uh, is a great thing. Uh, glad to be here with you, with Johnny's family, with Diane, who Abby and I spent so much uh, time with. And uh, uh, I join everybody in, in missing Johnny, but I'm glad to Cap, be able to be here to capture a little a part of so much of who he was uh, in this hour today. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mayor. Let me just say, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to be invited to be part of this. Uh, I never forget when Heath and, and Chris and Johnny, young Johnny, about a year ago came and said, Joe, what do you think? Would you do this? I, would you do this? And we're thinking about this was my dad and uh, two, two chiefs of staff. Uh, everybody was there. and. I said, I'd, I'll do anything you want me to do. So I was on very early. And then they had my, my wife, Gail, who's head of the Ameri Appalachian Regional Commission, and then my daughter, Heather, with me is even special. And to be with Diane and the entire Isaacson family, I thank you for allowing me to be part of the family last night and, and, and today, and I appreciate it so much. Uh, I just want to say to uh, President Moorhead, for a year at university to uh, to rise to the level to show that we're civility. This is going to be the birthplace of civility in political process now. And to have it here, uh, named after the person who is so genuine. This is some people are named, things are named after some people that you, you say, I don't know, well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and or they gave a lot of money and, and that's why their name's on the board. Or, to, but to have it genuine, they named after the most Public, the most civil public servant that I've ever seen in my life, truly. Uh, that's so genuine, and I think that's going to resonate. This is the inauguration for, and, and the, the Johnny Isaacson uh, School of Civility. Uh, we all, I'm going to put the quorum in there too, because uh, we need that also. Uh, and, but Johnny, he just, he just his, his whole body uh, was everything about that. And, and to have it here to where you're bringing people saying, this is what Johnny did. This is how Johnny did it. This is how Johnny would solve the problem. This is how Johnny would bring something. This is how he brought people together that basically had never sat down and worked together. Where he basically calmed the room down so we could have a, a, a civil discussion. That's really what it's about. And that's, that's what you all have done. So I say thank you. Thank you to University of Julia. Thank you to your entire staff and opening up then now I'm understanding we're going to take this around the country, right? And it's a model. And you should be so proud. And all of you. I'm proud to be part of it. I'm proud to have Roy here because I couldn't. I couldn't have had a better friend and someone who basically, with him and Johnny, I couldn't tell if they were Democrats or Republicans because they wanted to get something done. 
And if you want to get something done, it shouldn't be as he or Mario will prevent you from doing it. And that was the Isaacson way. So thank you all and to the great state of Georgia and go dogs. <laughs>